Now I want to introduce an amazing panel. Uh, Larry Lessig is the Roy Furman Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center of Ethics at Harvard University, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with him. So, <laughs> Professor Lessig. Thank you, Matt Schenk, and, um, and I'm very happy to be on this panel, too, uh, because uh, I think it's really important to place these different reform movements in context. Um, I don't accept the framing of the question in the panel which is constitutional versus legislative change. I don't believe in verses here. I think we have to learn to walk and chew gum and tweet at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and so I absolutely support the constitutional reform movements uh, in all their stripes, eager to get more people talking about the need for constitutional reform. I certainly support what Cenk is talking about with the idea of a Article 5 convention. But I also think we need to get clear on what the type of legislative change is that this country needs right now and start pushing for it. And so that's what I want to talk about, that kind of legislative change. Now, we need to put this in a little bit of historical context. Uh, we, of course, have been dabbling with the idea of what was traditionally called publicly funded elections for a long time. We forgot that for 32 years, ever since Richard Nixon until uh, Barack Obama, every single president was elected with public funding um, and benefited Republicans and Democrats alike. Ronald Reagan was the biggest beneficiary, running three times a national campaign using public funds. And the striking thing people forget about this is that when they ran with public funds, they were not fundraising while they were these candidates. So in his second time running, Ronald Reagan had zero fundraisers as a candidate for president. In this election cycle, Barack Obama had twice as many fundraisers as public rallies. He had 101 rallies and 221 fundraisers. So it radically changed what it means to be a candidate. And obviously, I don't think there are many people in this room that think it changed it for the better. Um, but we need to recognize that the model of public funding that was the model of the presidential public funding system is flawed in a number of important respects. The one thing Barack Obama did teach us was the extremely important value in having a system where people participated in the funding by small dollar contributions. That was extremely important in getting people invigorated, getting them behind the candidate, and building the movement of a new candidate. So what we've seen since that time is a whole series of proposals for what I called in my talk the kind of small dollar funded campaigns, bottom up citizen funded campaigns. And right now on the horizon, there, there are basically four examples out there to think about. The first example is one that was almost passed by the House just uh, at the, in this fall of 2010 called the uh, Fair Elections Now Act. And the Fair Elections Now Act is a proposal that basically allows a candidate to get matching funds for small, contribution, small dollar contributions taken in, and they get a certain amount of money as a payment once they qualify uh, at a certain level. Um, that, just, that proposal is still out there, but there's a number of competing proposals that I think are actually more interesting and, actually, and have more vitality behind them. One of them has been pushed by uh, Democracy 21 and the Brennan Center. And this is another matching fund-like proposal. But what distinguishes it from the other two that I'm going to talk about is that it's matching funds for larger dollar contributions. So if the objective is to, is to increase the number of people who are participating, meaning the number of people making contributions, this is benefiting people making larger contributions, not necessarily benefiting um, and creating lots of incentives for the smaller contributions. And some have calculated that half of the public money in that system would be directed towards large dollar contributions, leading some to wonder, should we be subsidizing rich people giving money to political candidates? Um, the second proposal that's out there uh, is a proposal just introduced um, about six weeks ago by Congressman John Sarbanes, son of Paul Sarbanes from Maryland. This is called the Grassroots Democracy Act. And the Grassroots Democracy Act is a very ambitious effort to create a series of incentives to give members a reason to opt into funding their campaigns with small dollar contributions only. So it has a matching fund component. It has a tax credit component. It has a it has a component that 
um, creates a, a, a special kind of a, a pilot for what I was talking about as vouchers. And it has what it calls a people's fund, which tries to skirt the constitutional concerns around giving money as a function of whether people have, have, are challenged by large dollar contributors. But it's an objective to give people confidence to come into a small dollar funded system. It's a fantastic bill. I strongly urge you to look at it. Um, and, and, and you can find it at grassrootsdemocracy.com. Uh, the third proposal is the one Trevor, I think, is going to talk about most. You have something, um, oh, this is actually a fourth, sorry. You have something on your, your chair from Reset, Re Represent Us. And this is what's referred to as the American Anti-Corruption Act. The thing that frustrates me about the people who push this is that um, because I'm so concerned about dependence, I really try to get people to think about improper dependency. Seems to me the appropriate way to refer to this act is the AA Act, but they haven't yet adopted this <laughs> nomenclature for it. Um, but this too has a very ambitious, um, effectively a uh, voucher-like program. It's tax credits to fund what would function the way a voucher program would, 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 would function, as well as uh, an incredible range of other fundamental changes, including affecting the incentives that lobbyists have, including taking on the power of super PACs, including very uh, strong uh, benefits for transparency. My favorite is a requirement that congressmen report how much time they spend raising campaign dollars. Um, so this is, I think, certainly, easily, the most ambitious of the, sta of the proposals that's out there. Okay, now, so we have this range. And here's the only point I want to make, and it's a point that's going to make uh, some people angry. I apologize for that, but here's the point. We have to worry about insider versus outsider politics here, too. We're at the very beginning of this movement to push the right kind of reform into the system. And we have to make sure that the insider reformers don't sell us out. Don't sell us out too soon for tiny little reforms that will not change the system, but at least make it so they get to claim credit as having passed some bill, in particular some bill they have proposed. This is a disaster right now. It is incredibly important that this debate about what the architecture of change should look like, whether it should be just matching funds or whether it should include vouchers or include tax credits, be allowed to continue and that you, people outside that beltway, participate in that. And so right now I can tell you inside DC there's a struggle among reformers as people are being told that your ideas are not approved because they've not been improved by the traditional insiders inside this game. So we need to look back to the reformers who've done enormous good work for the past 30 years. Uh, and obviously, Democracy 21 is at the top of that list. But we have to say to them, lay back a bit. We need the whole of this movement to participate in this reform movement. We don't need to end this debate right now. We're not going to get a bill passed in the next two years. What we need instead is a movement that builds the political support, the citizen support that it will require to actually get something like this passed. So I think you need to be part of that debate, and I think you need to be very vocal in supporting outsiders in this as much as the insiders might contribute. Let me introduce you. Okay, first of all, uh, I'm amused by the idea of somebody telling me my ideas are not approved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> and, and to buttress uh, Professor Lessig's point, I, I knew that uh, opportunists were coming in on this issue uh, to raise money, etc. when I saw Chuck Schumer's on the, uh, name on the list of people really interested in getting money out of politics. <laughs> really? Okay. All right. Now, Trevor Potter is the president of the Campaign Legal Center, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C., focused on the reform of money in politics, thank God. And he's also a member of Kaplan and Drysdale's Washington, D.C. office, where he leads the firm's political law practice. He's one of the country's best known and most experienced campaign and election lawyers and a former commissioner and chairman of the Federal Election Commission. I can go on, but again, I think you know Trevor. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Larry, for, uh, I, I think, pointing out the, the key, really, to this discussion, which is, I don't think any of us up here see 
uh, this as a debate bet with winners and losers between a constitutional option uh, and legislative options uh, or between various legislative options. Uh, when I uh, was talking to Larry about this, whatever it was now, a year and, year and a half ago, uh, I asked him to come to Washington and participate in a discussion about disclosure. And I said to him that I thought that the key step here was requiring disclosure of the spending of money in politics because traditionally it is that sort of uh, spotlight that has led to further changes. And Larry very graciously said, I'll come. But I have to tell you, I think you're wrong. <laughs> it's too small bore. You can't just look at disclosure, you have to look at more. And I think the fact that we're sitting here together today says that we both heard each other, uh, that there are things we can do right now. There are things that could be done in the next weeks. There are things that are gonna take years. So we need to see this as a collaborative process. Uh, and it's for that reason that I was delighted to be asked uh, by a group, uh, used to be called United Republic, it's now called Represent Us, you have the flyer on your chair. To work with them, my role was to be the lawyer working to draft the American Anti-Corruption Act with, with a team of lawyers. Uh, we sought Larry's advice, he's been involved in it, we sought the advice of a range of, of constitutional scholars. Uh, they have a website, uh, it's, I think they have several websites, but represent uh, us is, is uh, one of them on the flyer, and I think the other one is the anticorruptionact.org. Uh, if you go to that website, you'll not only see the full proposal, uh, and I, we do not have time to go through uh, whatever it is, about uh, 15 pages of legalese on the full proposal, <laughs> uh, but you'll also see another document uh, that I think shows how seriously we've taken these issues, and that is an explanation piece by piece by piece of why we think this is constitutional. And, and again, to go back to that, uh, as we talk about the need for a constitutional amendment which would change the entire landscape, we have to recognize that that is a long process. The point of the American Anti-Corruption Act was to show that it is possible to change the process in really significant ways that would revolutionize Washington. Now, without having to get all those states. That's not to say we shouldn't be looking at the amendment and working to the amendment, and I thought there were very good points made this morning about how the outside pressure for an amendment and for a convention leads Congress then to make changes they wouldn't otherwise lead. But to say there are, in fact, a lot of things we can do, realistically, perhaps, more than Congress will ever do, but that could be done constitutionally if we had enough pressure on Congress and, and the will to do it. So we set out to draft a very ambitious act that covered a whole, really put in one place the range of reforms that we think uh, would change Washington. Uh, the pe people who have been working on this have uh, support from uh, some Tea Party folks, from some Occupy Wall Street folks, from some convicted felons. Uh, <laughs> that, that would be Jack Abramoff who, <laughs> who basically says, stop me before I kill or lobby again. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's important, because Jack can say, look, I know how it's done. <coughs> and when we were talking about the drafting, he could say that doesn't go far enough, because I can figure out how to get around that. <laughs> so with all of that background, let me outline uh, briefly what the provisions are so you understand the scope. And again, you can always go and, and, and take a look at it in some detail. But the first is what we're calling conflict of interest, because the Supreme Court has recognized Congress recognizes that there is a power in the legislature to prevent conflicts of interest. And the conflict of interest we have, as Professor Lessig outlined in some length this morning, is between the people who are giving the money, lobbying Congress, hiring lobbyists to lobby Congress, all for specific legislative action or inaction, the protection of tax preferences and loopholes and so forth, on the one hand, and the member of Congress on the other, who is dependent on that money to run his or her reelection campaign, but is sitting there voting on the bills. And whether you look at it as 
a shakedown by the member or an attempt to buy results by the lobbyists and the outsiders, you end up with the same place, which is they're dependent on those lobbyists and that world and the people who hire the lobbyists rather than everyone else. So the first provision in the conflict of interest says members can't raise funds from people who are lobbying them because they want something in their official capacity. So you say, fine, you can do them a favor, but then you can't ask them for money. Secondly, the lobbyists can give only a small amount to protect their First Amendment expression rights to the members, $500, and they can't solicit money for the member from everyone else. They can't bundle money for the member, and the people who have hired them can't do so either. So you're, again, separating the, this conflict of interest and trying to ensure that the people who are voting in committee on specific bills are not doing so because the lobbyist is holding a fundraiser for them next week, or the other side of that coin. You know, I, 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 as a Washington lawyer, have clients who say, I went to see a member, I wanted to explain why I hoped they'd support my bill, I had good reasons, we had a good meeting, and the next day I got a call from their fundraiser saying, would I like to be on the host committee for the fundraiser they're holding next week? That, you know, that sort of shakedown is prohibited by this. Uh, so we move to close the revolving door. I had not heard Larry's numbers before today about the 50% of uh, senators and 42% of members of the House who then go on to be lobbyists. Um, but it's important that that not be the next meal ticket. So we extend the, lob the prohibitions on uh, doing any lobbying if you're a former member for five years, which we think is a really solid time to ensure that those people have gone off and done something different and perhaps productive after Congress. <laughs> I, I, I would say in passing, you know, I, I'm not that old, and I can remember a time in Washington where members of Congress wanted to be members of Congress, and only when they were defeated did they say, well, now what am I going to do? I'm going to be, I guess I'll be a lobbyist because those, you know, that's who will hire me, those are the people I know. Now, Almost every session of Congress, you have members of Congress walking out their office doors and turning the keys over and saying, I'm going to be a lobbyist because I got a better offer. That, you know, it didn't used to happen that way. And it, this will ensure it doesn't. Um, next, from the lobbying conflict of interest side, we move to campaign finance, which uh, Larry has highlighted. The big change here is to say that we want an alternative method for everybody in this room to be involved. The, the numbers that you heard this morning are pretty startling. Uh, it's one third of 1% of all Americans who give enough money, $200, to a candidate, a party committee, uh, or uh, a political committee to even be listed at the FEC as a donor. One third of 1%. So the other 99 and two thirds percents get covered by this proposal. And Part of this whole uh, American Anti-Corruption Act is designed to do the cross-party work uh, that Larry was referring to this morning. Um, we have had Republicans in this. We had on the conference call announcing this uh, somebody who was the ethics officer for the George W. Bush White House. He is a conservative libertarian Republican. His view is, I'm a Republican. I don't like paying taxes, I don't like huge government deficits, and I think we're getting it because of the current system. The insiders are buying everything they want, and I'm left out. So he has been one of the people pushing a proposal which he would describe from a conservative Republican side as a tax rebate. What he says is everyone pays taxes, whether it's income tax or a gas tax or a social security tax or something, we're all actually, uh, one way or another, paying for this government, and we all ought to get $100 back a year of our money, which we can then designate through the U.S. Treasury to one or more candidates, party committees, political committees. So we get our money back, and we turn around, and we fund the voices we want to fund. Uh, and that would provide an enormous pool of money outside of the traditional system. Uh, as Larry says, there are a number of good proposals that look at matching funds and everything else, but what we were looking for here is to say, here's sort of the gold standard. If we could get here, 
this changes the system more than anything else, and, and, I, and I think it does. Uh, beyond that, we do have disclosure in there and full transparency uh, on a range of issues. First, the whole lobbying world in Washington. There are plenty of people who leave Congress now. The next day, they turn up at a lobbying firm. They might be a former member. They are prohibited under the current law from lobbying for that first year, so they're not a lobbyist. They don't register. They're a consultant. They run the lobbying campaign. They are hired to advise on how to make this happen, but they don't actually go to the Hill and speak to someone. So we do a broad, require broader transparency with uh, people who run lobbying campaigns, people who advise on lobbying campaigns, people who are paid to help the lobbying campaign having to be disclosed so we know who they are. Uh, in addition to that, of course, uh, this includes the Disclose Act, and a point uh, on the panel that uh, was made this morning is that the important thing here is to require disclosure of money that is spent in elections. Whether it's by a C4 or a C6, it really shouldn't matter. Those are, those are more complicated questions we'll get to in a moment, but for the purposes of the American Anti-Corruption Act, let's say if you're running ads featuring members of Congress or their opponents, uh, in an election season, you should be disclosing where your money comes from, whoever you are. And you can do that constitutionally under Citizens United. So this act includes that as well. Um, finally, the enforcement side uh, is included in this. Uh, we do have a federal election commission. Uh, it is currently a well, let's see, highly ineffective would be understating it. Um, you know, as an ex-commissioner, uh, that commission can be improved. Um, instead of trying to micromanage what this act says is, we're going to make one key change right now, which is we're going to provide a tie-breaking vote, because believe it or not, the commission at the moment has six commissioners. It requires four to do anything. And it has three Republicans and three Democrats. <laughs> and for the last couple of years, anything important has deadlocked 3-3, three, three, which means it can't act. So it provides as a stopgap that there be a seventh commissioner to break ties. But then it says, we need to redesign this whole system, and it provides a mechanism for doing that. So that's the American Anti-Corruption Act. I think those key principles, the lobbying uh, conflict of interest provision, the taxpayer rebate and significant funds available for candidates, uh, the transparency and correcting the enforcement side really would change the way Washington works. Now, I think I have another couple minutes, and so I'm going to switch to, all right, I'm going to be e even more immediate. The American Anti-Corruption Act has not yet been introduced in Congress. The plan of its sponsors is to build a national constituency for it first, get people to talk about these issues, get a million signatures urging Congress to enact it, and then have members introduce it and fight it from there. So this is not going to happen tomorrow. This panel says, well, what are our alternatives from a constitutional amendment to the American Anti-Corruption Act to tomorrow? And the answer is, there are some things that could be done in the months ahead. And I want to quickly go through them. Some of them have been discussed uh, on the panels this morning, so I'll just put them in their context. I would start with that Federal Election Commission that doesn't work. There are currently five vacancies among six commissioners. <laughs> what that means is the law says the commissioners hold over. They stay there until either they die or their successors are qualified. And that means the president has to nominate someone, the Senate has to confirm them for the successors to appear. President Obama has no nominees before Congress for any of those five vacancies. Now, I presume he's aware of the existence of the Federal Election Commission. <laughs> the problem is he's got the same partisan divide in Congress, uh, and the Republican leadership has said to him, three of those seats are ours, thank you very much. You don't nominate. We tell you the names, and then you give them back to us, and we confirm them. And the Democratic leaders say, that's how it works for us, too. Uh, we'll confer with you, but we're going to agree on who the Democrats are. The Republicans are going to tell you who the Republicans are. Then you are going to nominate them. They're going to come in as a package, and we will bless them. 
Well, the Constitution wasn't actually written that way for all those people who believe in strict constructionism. It says the president nominates, the Senate advises, and confirms. So what I would recommend here is that the White House get off the stick and figure out who it wants to nominate. Yeah. To try to do something on a cross-partisan basis and to avoid the partisan gridlock we have, because you right now can hear uh, Mitch McConnell saying, those are Democratic nominees, those are you know, Democrats in wolf's clothing, et cetera, and um, I'm not, you know, we're not going to confirm them. Uh, why not have the president pull together a nonpartisan, bipartisan, cross-partisan group of distinguished Americans, judges, prosecutors, state election people, and say, give me some names. I, you know, Congress used to give me the names and I had no choice politically. I'm asking you, Americans, to give me some names. And you give me a list of five and I promise constitutionally I will nominate those five and I'm gonna turn around to the Senate and say, if you don't like them, you can tell the public exactly what's wrong with them. Otherwise, confirm them. That would, I think, be a real step in cross-partisanship here, and it would break the deadlock we have at the FEC. Uh, for those of you who would like to see that spelled out in more detail, I spent this week uh, struggling to write an op-ed for the Washington Post, which is in tomorrow's edition and on their website, which goes on to explain you know, what's going on at the commission and how this w would really make a difference. So I, I think we could start with the Federal Election Commission. Beyond that, we've discussed the IRS a bit today. Um, the IRS is not deadlocked because it has one commissioner, but it is desperately trying to hide from this discussion. Uh, and, and I don't blame them. Uh, they get complaints, oh, about once a week from various groups saying, you know, that C4 and this C4 are violating the law. And they, uh, at one stage, wrote a letter back uh, to Democracy 21. And the letter said, we've, we've got all your complaints and we want to assure you we're thinking about them. <laughs> we're aware of the issue. Well, you might have thought that was milk toast, but to the Republicans in Congress, that was a bomb. They were horrified. And they wrote a letter back to the IRS that said, don't you dare think about this. <laughs> Seriously. They said this is an important partisan issue and you have to stay out of it. So the IRS could do uh, a number of things, as was laid out on the panel before, such as figuring out and being really clear about when these nonprofits are really political organizations, because if they're political organizations under the IRS rules, they're already required to disclose their donors or pay a substantial tax, uh, and figure out under what circumstances they're political organizations, what the major purpose test is, uh, and, and move from there. So that could be done by the IRS itself, which is, the last time I looked, part of the administration. The president isn't going to play politics with the IRS, but I think he could say, uh, this is an important issue, and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you to do something. So we have that. The Securities and Exchange Commission. We've heard there are proposals before it now. Uh, they haven't done anything yet. There, that would deal with the specific issue of the transparency of uh, political expenditures by corporations. I don't believe that rulemaking uh, currently includes the possibility, under, as the British do, of requiring shareholder approval of a budget or some form of approval of political spending, uh, but that would be worth looking at. Uh, there was a reference in the panel this morning uh, to the possibility of doing uh, similar action through the states. Uh, you may have followed it, uh, Connecticut. The legislature there actually managed to pass a law uh, that said that corporations either incorporated in the state of Connecticut or doing business in the state of Connecticut, which would be most major corporations in the United States, have to get advanced shareholder approval before spending a certain level of money. Now, that was vetoed by the governor, uh, the Democratic governor, on the basis that corporations didn't like it. Um, <laughs> But if this is a national movement, if that's the sort of thing that can be pushed across the country, uh, you might find governors of both parties uh, less inclined to veto it. So those are the sorts of things that I think can be done in the short term. Uh, I'd, I'd like to end on looking at, at Citizens United, since this is to some extent how we all got in this room, and saying, 
There are two things in Citizens United that have not worked out the way the court said they would. One is these and this spending is not wholly, totally, truly, the three words that are there, independent of candidates and party committees. <laughs> but what that means is that it's not protected by Citizens United. It doesn't have a constitutional right to be unlimited if it is not independent. So what we can do here constitutionally without changing the court is ensure that there are standards for the independence of this spending. That could be done by the Federal Election Commission, the newly reconstituted with five new commissioner Federal Election Commission, tomorrow. It's, they, they have the statutory authority to write those regs. It's a long story, but they've actually twice wrote bad regs. They were sued. The courts agreed that they were bad and, and not extensive enough. And they were, wrote, went back and wrote a third bad one, which we're now living under. But a good FEC could fix that. The other area is disclosure. Uh, as you heard this morning, Citizens United has one bright spot. 8-1, the court says, full disclosure of campaign spending, election spending is constitutional. Not only that, but Justice Kennedy goes on to say it's a great thing. If you read his opinion, he says, for all of you who are worried about Citizens United and allowing corporate spending, you don't need to worry because it's going to be disclosed through the magic of something <laughs> called the internet. <laughs> Everyone's going to know where the money is coming from. Corporate shareholders can hold their, corpor their uh, corporations responsible, and average voters are going to know who is speaking, who is funding the ads. They can make their decisions not only about what they think of the ad based on that, but then they can hold the office holders accountable and see if they're corrupted by all that spending. Well, you can't do that if it's secret. The FEC could again write a regulation that required it because the McCain-Feingold law, those of us who worked on it thought, did require full disclosure of spending. It says that in the law. <laughs> the FEC changed that in a regulation so that you now have this enormous loophole and if you don't designate your contribution for uh, this particular advertising, then it isn't required. And that could be fixed by a newly reconstituted FEC. So conclusion, yes, we need to look at the long-term constitutional options. Yes, I believe we need to look at the medium-term legislative options like the American Anti-Corruption Act. But we can also do some of these smaller bore things that would actually make a difference, and we can push those now. Thanks. Uh, I found out some shocking things in there. Um, it turns out President Obama is not strongly challenging Republicans. I did not see that coming. <laughs> not doing much about the FEC and campaign finance reform? Obama? Huh, shocking. Uh, now, to, to that point, I just want to emphasize this point. Um, two points, actually. Look, uh, this money that goes into campaigns it does something really interesting that I don't think uh, a lot of people talk about. It not only gets the people who get the money to be elected and hence presents that bias, which we've all talked about, but it also has a secondary bias, which is that it go flows towards really strong Republicans that ask for the moon and really weak Democrats that say, all right, thank you, sir, may we have another. So if you're a strong Democrat, as Howard Dean was in 2004, you are not going to get that money, okay? If you're a corporatist Democrat that says, well, we can make a compromise. For example, instead of having six people on the FEC, we'll just have one. <laughs> then you get the money. And don't forget, President Obama raised a billion dollars. And some of that was small money, but a lot of it was really large money. So is it surprising that the guy who raised a billion dollars is not really that interested in fixing a system that got him elected president of the United States twice. So my point there isn't that you should be opposed to President Obama or Democrats. It's that when they ask you to clap louder as a solution to, hey, how are we gonna fix this system? Don't believe them. They are part of the insiders. They're not part of the outsiders. Uh, now. Yeah. 
I want to introduce Dr. Trent Lang. He's served on the board of the California Clean Money Campaign since 2003. He's been the spokesperson, lobbyist, and policy expert for the California Clean Money Campaign. Now, that's a lobbyist I can get behind. Um, and analyzing campaign spending and proposing solutions to campaign finance issues for both California and elsewhere. Uh, Trent has also got a PhD from UCLA with multidisciplinary academic background in computer science, cognitive science, cognitive psychology, and is the author of over 20 academic publications. Thank you. Uh, first, I am going to need you to press the B key. And can you hand me the thing that's right there? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. This is a this is a fabulous conference. I'm so. Just if you the two. Oh, okay. There you go. What did I do wrong? That's why I didn't get up. All right. <laughs> you are very sensible. Hey. All right. Derek Cressman very often saves the day. <laughs> uh, so, so thrilled to have everybody, everybody here, so many big faces, uh, 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 people that I know have been very active in this problem here in California. And as you've been hearing today, there are multiple levels that we have to work to address the problems of big money in politics. You know, eventually, a constitutional amendment uh, <coughs> a, a, a solution, uh, a good, very strong, uh, national solutions like the uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Act that may take a while, but you absolutely need to build a movement. Um, but also, we believe uh, um, legislatively, uh, especially here in states, like in California, that we can take some very, very important and key steps going forward. And so I want to talk about that, one of the focuses that we're doing. Uh, the California Clean Money Campaign has been working with California Common Cause and the League of Women Voters and other groups here in California for a long time on public financing of campaigns. Uh, uh, we've had some successes. Uh, recently, the city of Los Angeles dramatically strengthened its small uh, uh, donor matching fund system uh, for the city of Los Angeles uh, uh, to be, make it more like the New York City, which is a great uh, model uh, so that uh, small donors get matched up to four to, times to one in the general election, increasing and strengthening the small, small power of small donors. Uh, that was a long process to get that going, but we hope that will serve as sort of a model for public finance in California. Um, but one of the things that we've seen here after Citizens United, of course, is the problem of the absolute huge amounts of money uh, in, in super PACs, that the overwhelming uh, super PACs and generally, where money is dominating the system and even dominating the sorts of legislation that can be considered uh, without people knowing uh, uh, who is behind it. And if people knew who was behind these super PACs and attack ads and, and, and even uh, behind the sorts of uh, 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 commercials that attack legislation, uh, it would make a, big, a huge difference. That's, that's our belief. So here, this shows just, oh, sorry. Uh, let's see if I get this. So here, you can see this is a screenshot from one of those super PAC ads this, this year. Uh, tell me if you can figure out who paid for this based off of this disclosure. Very much at the bottom, you say, paid for by Restore Our Future, Inc., which is responsible for the content of this message, not authorized by candidate or candidates committees, uh, restoreourfuture.com. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's one of the perfect examples of, of why we need this. So. So this, this is the sort of disclosure that we have currently uh, in, in national ads. Nobody can tell who's paying for it. So you look at these sorts of uh, 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 ads. These are the sorts of names that you see disclosed nationally. Why don't I do oh, I got it. Okay. I'll do what you do. Ah, okay, thank you. There we go. Um, so Nash, on the national super PAC ads, you see Restore Our Future. That was one of the largest ones. American Crossroads, uh, that's, of course, Carl Rove's group, $105 million. Crossroads, grassroots policy strategies. These are all revealed in the fine print on the television ads. Uh, uh, Priorities USA Action, uh, that's the pro-democratic one. Americans for Prosperity, that's the Koch brothers. 
Uh, and there are lots more uh, 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 beyond that. I, I'm neglecting the most important one. Go to the next slide. Uh, the, the most devious <laughs> and dangerous of them all. <laughs> Americans for a better tomorrow, tomorrow. Though I understand that may be closing now. Or? It, it, it has closed. It, it has, has closed. Its money has disappeared, never to be found. Oh my God. <laughs> that makes it even more dangerous. So that's the sort of problem that we have, that have nationally. Uh, go ahead. So there is, there is a bill, there was a bill, uh, uh, and it will be again, called the National Disclosed Act that you've heard, heard about, uh, that would address this problem. So you see who's paying for the uh, ads themselves. Uh, uh, the National Disclosed Act made the most progress in 2010. And what it would have done besides kind of pierce through this veil so that you, 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 uh, uh, the nonprofits, when they spend on political ads, have to show who's paying for them, it would have actually required the, uh, the president or CEO of the largest funder of the ad to go on screen and say that uh, uh, we approve of this message, that we funded and help approve this message. That would have made a huge difference. Uh, it passed the Democratic uh, House of Representatives in 2010. It got 59 votes to break the filibuster. 59, fell one vote short. If we had that, then we would know who, at least, who was paying for all these uh, 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 super PAC ads nationally. Um, so, let's go to the next slide. So that's good, they're gonna be reintroducing that bill, but the chances of it probably going through or uh, nationally in the next couple years, it may be a very difficult slog because of the opposition you have there. But in California, we don't have to worry about the filibuster. So we can actually do something here in California and serve as a model for the rest of the country. And that's what we're looking at with the California uh, Disclose Act. Uh, so we have the, the same sorts of problems here in California. $372 million was spent on ballot measures ads this year. In fact, in California, it's, it's worse because we have the same sort of independent expenditures with candidates that everybody has to deal with, but we also have ballot measures that have huge influence on our, uh, on our state. These are the names of some of the largest spending ones this year. Stop special interest money now, stop corporate special exemptions from campaign finance rules, the 2012 Auto Insurance Discounts Act. All sound great, don't they? But nobody knows who is behind them. In, unless you go to the Secretary of State website, and, and most of the funders are actually revealed there, and so the press can talk about them sometime, except in cases in this recent Arizona case where there is $11 million that was essentially laundered from the Arizona uh, nonprofit uh, Americans for Responsible Leadership. And it took a California Supreme Court decision on the last day to uh, uh, on the Sunday before the election to reveal uh, uh, that two other nonprofits, one associated with the Koch brothers, funded it. So. That's, that's the problem. Uh, so here's how disclosure looks in California. Uh, this was a, a, a screenshot on the current law uh, 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 disclosure for yes on 26, a proposition in November 2012. Again, you can't see paid for by stop hidden taxes. Uh, as Bob Stern would say, you have to kind of freeze frame this to even notice this at all. And then you might be able to know sometimes in California it reveals the two largest funders buried in the fine print. Um, what the California Disclose Act would do would change that completely by changing it so the top three funders have to be revealed on the ads themselves. This is what those yes on 26 ads would have to display. Can you see how much this would change the game when it comes to California ballot measures? When, when you have, instead of stop hidden taxes in the fine print, you see that this proposition was paid for by Chevron, American Beverage Association, and Philip Morris. It would completely change the game when it, talks, when it comes uh, to legislation. One of the reasons the California Clean Money Campaign is particularly interested in the Disclose Act is because eventually we're going to have to put public financing of whatever store we have on the ballot in California, and we'll be attacked by these same very sorts of people. And if we can disclose them there, then the public financing initiative will have a better chance to pass when it goes on. So this is kind of across the board, yes on 25, that was a corporate initiative. Uh, yes on 25 was one that was actually supported mostly by labor, so uh, it's, it's completely nonpartisan. If you're the three largest funders, one minute, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, 
That's what we're uh, talking about. There was a bill this year, AB 1648, the California Disclose Act that would have passed this. Uh, Assemblymember Julia Brownlee, who's now in Congress, she was the author. She's a fabulous author. Uh, Clean Money Champion, we've called her. Uh, California Clean Money Campaign sponsored it. The California Chamber of Commerce and its allies heavily, heavily, heavily lobbied against this bill. Very heavily lobbied against it. But 350 organizations and leaders endorsed it. It was passed by the assembly, got through the assembly uh, on August 20th. So uh, to put uh, this measure on the ballot in November 2014, uh, uh, it was too late to, to get through the Senate uh, and pass. So we gotta start again this next year. And that was partially due to the California Chamber of Commerce and all of its allies that lobbied so heavily against it. But we're gonna come back. Uh, there is a huge coalition, I know many of you yourselves uh, have signed, uh, over 84,000 Californians signed petitions for it. This is how we get grassroots activism for legislation and really put the pressure on. That's how it got through the assembly and that's how we're gonna get it through next year. 12 newspaper editorials, over 350 organizations and leaders endorsed it, uh, not just the League of Women Voters and Common Cause and Public Citizen, but, but all sorts of groups across the realm and national groups. We're going to, this is how you, you build and uh, push legislation. Um, I'll skip this, we can skip this one. 84% uh, of the Californians support this kind of disclosure, just to show that. Uh, okay, go to the next one. Ah, there we go. Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes for why disclosure is, is a, a constitutional from Justice Antonin Scalia. Requiring people to stand up in public for their political acts fosters civic courage without which democracy is doomed. So if we can, the Disclose Act is in some ways it's small bore. It's a first step. You need lots of other steps, but we believe it will start to sh shed light uh, on, on the situation to help some of the bigger things. Because when, when people see very clearly in all the ads that they're deluged with, who is paying for them? That the same corporations and billionaires every single time, that will help build uh, popular pressure, we believe, not only so that bad things don't get passed when, they, when they're fooled by those deceptive ads, but also build popular pressure for uh, uh, the, the additional much larger reforms that we also also need. So uh, last slide, uh, I'll just say, you know, why is California important? As California goes, so goes the nation. Uh, and part of this is, uh, uh, you know, California is, is, of course, if you look at it in size of its economy, the eighth largest, uh, it would be counted as the eighth largest country in the world if it were a country. So, so if we can make these sorts of reforms in California, and we've got a real chance because we don't have to worry about the filibuster, we've got a very strong activist community, we can really show uh, uh, examples of how this stuff can work. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, one quick note on that. Uh, Mitch McConnell says that if we uh, find out who the funders are, that that would be intimidating them. <laughs> <laughs> Their hundreds of millions of dollars aren't intimidating anybody. If we find out about it, that's apparently intimidation. And, and they know it, too. All, I assume a lot of you are here from California. Uh, my favorite one was the anti-union prop that was disguised as an anti-corporate prop funded by the corporations. Well, if you thought you were gonna win and the American people were on your side, wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just say it's a pro-corporation prop, right? Because they know that they are not popular and, and that if we know who it is, they're gonna, we're gonna vote against them. All right, I wanna take uh, questions from everybody as much as we can here in about 15 minutes. If you could line up there or there, that would be great. We'll take it one in a, uh, at a time. I think I just want to take it one at a time, but please, 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 let's keep it quick. Uh, yeah, this is uh, for Trevor. You listed several things we can do now. Do you recommend that us as individuals contact the Federal Election Committee, contact the White House, contact the IRS, and contact the SEC, and advocate for the things you described? Sure, I think citizen contact is really vital. Um, on, you know, the FEC, the pressure point is going to be the White House. They're the ones who have to realize that this this A makes a big difference and can, they can do it and that people want them to do it. So I think that I'd start with the FEC. Hi, Trevor, this is one of the questions for you as well. So if we think about, if we think about uh, 
a constitutional amendment for everything we wanted as being the 100% solution. Sort of imagine we got everything that we wanted. Um, and we take a look at the Anti-Corruption Act as it's set up right now. So what percentage of the solution, right, is the Anti-Corruption Act giving us? Another way of asking is, what are we leaving on the table that the amendment process would cover for us? Um, I think it gives you a very sizable percentage. Uh, you know, there are a couple thoughts there. One is that a constitutional amendment uh, would also deal with the state issues. Uh, at the moment, it, it, the, by definition, a, a piece of legislation can't overturn the Supreme Court when it's interpreting the Constitution. So it wouldn't deal with the ability of corporations to make fully independent expenditures. That would still be there. It wouldn't allow states to restrict that. Uh, so I think that's an, impo an important area which requires either a change in the views of the court uh, and thus of the just justices who are on it or an amendment. That, that would be a principal difference there. Uh, also, we, we don't really know where we are with the idea that because individuals and corporations under speech under uh, Citizens United have the right to make an independent expenditure, is that really the same as what we've seen, which is the super PAC phenomenon, where you give your money to a group and they decide who, is, who they're going to support. Um, that may be limitable under current law. We try to do that in uh, the American Anti-Corruption Act. If we can't limit that, if, if unlimited contributions to these outside groups are permitted, then the, again, the only way to reach that would be through an amendment. So yeah, it, it does a lot of what we want to do, but it definitely doesn't do everything. All right, I, I want to go back and forth here and, and include some questions from the other room as well. Uh, Somebody wrote here, does money have to equal speech? I haven't heard this aspect addressed yet. Can we change that aspect of the equation? So my own view is we don't, uh, if we solve this in the ways that are described, so the American Anti-Corruption Act, in my view, the Constitution should be amended to give Congress the power to limit expenditures and limit contributions. Um, if those two things were there, I don't think we need to, and I do think it would be harmful to take the additional step of saying money is not speech. And the reason for that is, you know, for example, Los Angeles City Council could pass a rule that says you can only spend $50 to run for the campaign to be a Los Angeles City Council person. I guess there is a city council here, right? So, um, so what would that law be? That law would be a incumbency protection act, and somebody's seems to me, First Amendment right to say, no, I need to be able to spend money to be able to challenge, at least in this way, would be undermined by that change. And, and I don't think we'd need to threaten that liberty that we all have right now if we address the problem in the way that I think we've described it should be addressed. Yeah, Professor Sachs, I think, from Columbia Law School wrote a, a great article about that you might want to check out. And, uh, and look, I, I'm in favor of the nuclear option on corporations not being people. But money not being speech is actually very complicated and something you have to be careful about. All right, Jay. Thanks. Uh, uh, two questions. Um, Citizens United took a very narrow case under a right, very right wing court about a, a video about uh, Hillary and blew it up into a massive decision, OK? So in your, uh, what I'm hearing today is very encouraging. On the other hand, this is the same Supreme Court. It's not likely to change soon. It could change back again. What in your legislative calculations would prevent, or where, where do you think you're most exposed? Where do you think you're least exposed in, in for the, with this kind of court? And the second question I have is Alan Grayson, just in the last week or 10 days, put through a, um, a proposed bill that had a lot of restrictions on corporate money on the legislature side. So could you comment on those as well? Thank you. I'll start and then move down the panel. But I, I think the, the, the part of the answer is that uh, it's my sense that, that this court was taken aback, the five justices in the majority were taken aback by the national reaction to Citizens United. Uh, this is a much bigger case than they had expected. The reaction was, was much more negative than they thought. Uh, I, I have not read the speech, but Justice Alito uh, apparently gave a talk two nights ago at the Federalist Society where he basically said, uh, this is this is blown up uh, in, in a way we didn't expect. The opponents of this case have done a very good job, he said, of um, 
really generating criticism of it. I think as a result of that, what we're seeing at the moment at least is that the courts do not want another major confrontation over campaign finance. Since Citizens United, they have largely been ducking these cases where they can. There's, there's one in the process now that argues that corporations should have the same rights as individuals to make direct contributions to candidates. Um, and the lower courts have said basically that's above our pay grade. Uh, we, we, un we, we understand the logic of it under Citizens United, but the Supreme Court has to make that decision. So it's coming up. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if they declined to hear it and left the, their previous opinions in place. So it's a, a way of saying that you're absolutely right, of course, that this court can change its mind. This court can do things worse than Citizens United. Uh, but my sense for the moment, at least, is that they're not looking for that fight and that we have drafted the American Anti-Corruption Act based on current precedents, based on things that this court has said to make it, we believe, constitutional. Yeah, let me just add, emphasize one part about that. What I think of as the core part to the American Anti-Corruption Act and to Sarbanes's uh, Grassroots Democracy Act is absolutely untouchable by the Supreme Court under its jurisprudence, even in the recent cases, the court has signaled that it supported, it found constitutional, these efforts at, at this kind of citizen, uh, or what they call public funding. So there's no reason to not move forward with legislation because of your fear of the Supreme Court overturning it. In my, in my way of looking at it, if they overturned public funding, that would make my day, right? Make my day, <laughs> because you know then the revolution would be here. That would be the most outrageous. And, and it's true, all these sorts of legislative solutions that we're looking at, we're crafting around the Supreme Court's recent decisions. I mean, the Supreme Citizens United, eight out of the nine justices said the disclosure is good. Uh, hopefully they would be okay with a sort of really, you know, in your face disclosure so that people see who's playing political ads in the Disclose Act. And same thing with public financing solutions. Arizona, Maine, and Connecticut had fabulous uh, clean elections, clean money style systems that were put into place that provided public financing for uh, campaigns and matching funds when they're outspent by outside groups. The Supreme Court uh, um, uh, cut back that part, uh, but they left public financing in place. So we have to be careful what they'll end up doing with our current proposals. Um, Shink asked where the money was going in the, uh, the major media and where that money goes. I'd highly encourage you to look into it because my impression um, is that the three-letter networks in particular have been deeply in debt for a very long time and that they now function on a more or less de facto U.S. system where with debt ceilings that are controlled by the banks and the bank has the control whether they continue to receive the funding necessary to support their enormously inefficient infrastructure and without that they would be insolvent almost instantly. Um, that in turn becomes a de facto subsidy when it comes around to election time because then the advertising costs go up dramatically, which buffers their year-to-date balance sheets and makes it look like they're less in debt than they are. Um, it also becomes a de facto handout to the banks because often those increased rates are a way for them to recoup the interest that's constantly being paid on the loans that are constantly ballooning, just like with our government. My question, however, to the panel uh, regards... <laughs> Sorry, I just, I, I wanted to get that one out, but um, <laughs> my, my question to the panel actually regards going outside the box. I really liked uh, the Grassroots Democracy Act. I was a little disappointed it didn't get any mention because it involves turning the paradigm on its head in a sense. Um, in, um, I believe that it uh, reflects a growing trend uh, or at least a desired trend towards gamification. Um, in advertising, gamification is when you participate in some stupid survey. All right, so um, do you want to ask about that act? For sure, no. Um, what I'd like to ask is, uh, is, is whether you guys believe that we could benefit by instead of using uh, the FEC, SEC, things like that as enforcers of penalties, if using them as enforcers of, um, of benefits would not in encourage people to play properly instead of expecting that everybody will do the right thing and enforcing doing wrong, why are we not expecting everybody to do the wrong thing and rewarding doing right? Because if they were the beneficiaries of those, okay. uh, you okay. know, those okay. departments. Okay, 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 okay. enough. Sorry, uh, it, I mean, it, it's kind of a complicated question. All right, anybody have an answer? 
I, I thought I did utter the words, Grassroots Democracy Act. Many times, I mean, I'm a big supporter of it, and exactly for this reason, it does encourage and create a different set of incentives. So I think you should look at it and support it. All right, I got a brief question because it's written. Um, is one panel nervous about, uh, is the panel nervous about opening the uh, Constitution to an amendment that negative clauses will be added uh, to our reform amendment, uh, poison pills, et cetera? Uh, I can quickly answer that one, and that is, um, look, everybody's, of course, scared if you go to a convention. My God, what'll happen? We might actually change the system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A, that would be awesome, uh, and, and B, remember, three quarters of the states have to ratify anything, including uh, amendment proposals that come out of a convention. If you don't have an amendment that is enormously popular, you have no chance of having three quarters of the states ratify. All right, we have about a minute left, I think. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, <clears throat> The media is obviously uh, vital in disseminating the information to the masses to build the movement necessary of, of people to get behind this. Um, as you stated earlier, the, the TV ad spending astronomical at nearly a billion dollars this year. How do we disenfranchise or disincentivize the media away from political ad spending? Like, that's got to be a major part of the strategy is getting the media to report on our initiatives and not um, sweeping it under the car carpet? How do we make it a bigger issue? That's such a great question, because honestly, I'd never thought of that. Uh, and one way to do it, I guess, is I think Char was saying is, we can do the UK proposal. You're not allowed to do TV ads. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about a nuclear option? <laughs> but, but the TV guys, man, they will come to get you. Uh, anybody else have an idea about how to do that? All right, one minute left, one final question. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, just a, a, a quick um, rubber meeting the road question. I'm with Occupy Democracy Pasadena. In the last eight months, we've been actually working on our Congressman Adam Schiff, who said there was no way, snowballs, chance in hell, that he was gonna do any kind of resolution to have a constitutional amendment, too slippery a slope. Well, we worked on him, we turned, on, turned a thousand signatures in, did rallies, et cetera. He finally came up with HJR 111. My question is, with all these moving parts, a lot of which I've learned for the first time today, we've met with our new congresswoman, Judy Chu, two weeks ago. She's on board with this. We're meeting with them, we wanna push them, and now I'm not sure how to articulate and what to articulate. This is very easy. We, everyone in this room can meet with their, cons their, their rep. You just make an appointment, and you get in there, and you start asking for results, and we've done it. So we want to know, okay, there's all these moving parts. How do we get this going? What do we ask for? Very good. What do we ask for? Well, one thing I agree with uh, Cenk on, I think you should be meeting with your state reps. And I think you ought to be saying to your state reps, let's begin the conversation of what it would take to get California to pass a uh, call for a constitutional Article 5 convention. I think, you know, you can do all of it. But that's one thing we could do that if, in fact, that happened, that would be a bombshell. And in terms of meeting with your congresswoman, uh, I think you can say, uh, we want you to be prepared to co-sponsor the uh, American Anti-Corruption Act when it's introduced. And in the meantime, we'd really like you to call the White House and say, hi, I'm a new member of Congress, and why in the world haven't you done something about the FEC? <laughs> yeah, can, can I just, Jay, Jay. Jay, can I just have one more thing? Yeah, I mean, we, we both have been bad about one important part about this act. You can go to the website right now and you can become a co-sponsor. The strategy of the act is they want one, there will be one million citizen co-sponsors before that will be taken back to Washington. So it's the quintessential example of the outsider's strategy first. So we need a million co-sponsors before we're allowed to go into the inside so you can begin to spread that co-sponsoring job. Uh, paper petition uh, over there, and my final note is, look, when you, when you go to talk to your state people about a convention, uh, it's no longer pretty please. Uh, it's, it's actual action. If they call for a convention at the state level, a convention happens. It is not theoretical, it is not maybe, it is not awareness, it's we're coming for you. We need change and we're gonna get change, and we could do it state by state. I want to thank this excellent panel uh, today, and thank you for uh, listening as well.